So here are some of the topics that we're going to go over tonight. We're going to talk about cooking safety, electrical safety, open flame safety. That could be candles. It could be uh, talking about other heating appliances, such as a fireplace. Uh, even though it's not really a flame, it could be a space heater. Just all that type of general safety with open flame. Uh, general safety precautions, slips, trips, falls, stuff like that. Smoke and carbon monoxide alarms, escape route planning, and fire extinguishers. So we're basically going to do about half an hour in here, and then we're going to go out to our bay where that's the rest of it is hands-on. Uh, we have some prizes, we have some gift cards to give away, so stay tuned and make sure you're awake for some of our trivia questions. So I'll have Jeff talk to you about the history of our uh, fire department here. All right, well welcome everybody. Um, as Dan said, we're gonna go through some stuff in here pretty quick. If you do have questions, please hang on to those questions. When we finish up outside, we are gonna come back in here for the last 15, 20 minutes, hopefully, be able to answer your questions, okay? If we don't get to them all, we'll still be here. Those of you who wanna leave, can leave, and if you have questions, we'll stay in and answer those for you. So Brooklyn Park Fire was started in 1957. It was started by residents here in the city. They went out and appropriated their own funds, bought their own fire truck. Didn't really have gear for years upon years until we get into the 70s and, and uh, late 70s to be exact. Um, they started getting turnout coats and gear, didn't have SCBAs. Um, so what you see today is completely different than what was, okay? Started by just people that wanted to provide protection for their community. Um, we've grown now to be a very, very busy fire department. We handle over 9,000 calls a year. We're an all-hazards department, that means we run everything. So from medicals, every medical that goes out, we run on. Every fire call that goes out, bombs, um, hazardous materials, all types of rescues, water, ice, high angle, low angle, confined space, you name it, we do it. Okay, um, we don't just go to fires. Um, we do public education, we do community risk reduction, which is part of the program you're in tonight. <clears throat> we go out to schools, we're out in the community all the time, trying to give back, trying to preach this message of prevention, okay? And trying to make our community safer. Today, we are staffed 24 hours a day at three of our four stations. That gives you two firefighters in each station. We have six firefighters and one battalion chief on duty 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So you have seven firefighters always on duty. Monday through Friday during office hours, those numbers come up a little bit. You get an additional four or five staff of our office uh, staff, Dan, myself, uh, one of our, two of our chiefs. Um, so we bump that number up a little bit. Um, and that, that's what we have in the city today. Okay, so um, we've come a long way from where we were in 1957. Um, things have changed, fire has changed, medicine has definitely changed. Um, and so we're off and running. All right, we're a very, very busy department. We're still considered a combination department, meaning so in addition to these, the full-time staff you mentioned, we have about 24 paid on-call firefighters who, much like Becca, will sign up to take shifts in place of full-timers when they're, they're on vacation or sick leave or also just to ride as a third person on our engine. Uh, when we have a fire, everyone is called into action. So all of our firefighting staff is called into action. We still bring home pagers even though we may be full time. And so when, if there's a fire in Brooklyn Park, you're gonna hopefully have 50 people coming to the station and going out to your house. It all depends on where everyone is with vacations and things in their life though. One addition we have to let you know about, Tim Bauer is over here. Tim is also one of our pay on call members. So Tim will be helping tonight. Thank you, Tim. Hey, Tim. Hello. <laughs> um, all right, we're on the next slide. So here's our first trivia question. Everybody ready? So we'll do this for, uh, $5 gift card to Quick Trip. Five bucks to Quick Trip. All right. So, what is the number one cause of fires here in Brooklyn Park? Tim, you can't answer. Cooking. <laughs> oh. First correct out. answer right here. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Perfect. So, cooking is by far and by far the number one cause of fires here in Brooklyn Park. Wow. Over 27% of our fires in Brooklyn Park are started by cooking. All right. Cooking is something that um, we as adults are supposed to be able to handle, right? Uh, obviously, we're not doing a real good job of that as a generalization. Uh, this is a typical cooking fire. See, it starts with grease or something on your stovetop. Doesn't matter if it's electrical appliance or gas appliance. Oils and greases heat up to the point that they leave the pan. They leave the pan, and this is kind of when you probably are calling us at that point. They take off, they grow very, very quickly. 
We do not ever, ever, ever use water on a grease fire. Okay, one of the things we talked about is using this, this pot, right? If, my, if this is my stove, I'm cooking away here. I have a cover that fits whatever I'm cooking on my stove top. One, I should never leave my food. I shouldn't leave my kitchen when I'm cooking. I need to be an adult. Two, that pan and its contents start on fire. Not a problem, I got this. I'm gonna grab my lid that I already have. I'm gonna slide my lid over. I'm gonna turn off the heat. I'm gonna exit. I'm gonna call 911, okay? By doing this, you have put the fire out. You remove one of the things we need, and that's oxygen, right? We need fuel, we need heat, and we need oxygen. In the simplest terms, by placing this over the top, we remove that oxygen and we've smothered the fire. The fire's out, okay? There used to be the old wife's tales to throw baking soda on it. Great, if you catch it at the right time, okay? If it doesn't splash onto your backsplash, right? And then create that, that fire going up. Cover's the best thing you can do. Never ever water, okay? This is gonna expand if you think of one droplet. Think of an eraser on a pencil. It expands 1,700 times when water is introduced to it. You go from something, this is a little, a little crazy, but let's take this away. Something that's controllable by putting a lid on it to throwing water on it. Here's your 1,700 time growth. You're not gonna be able to control that, okay? You'll see in this video here, dangers of turkey fryers, and you'll also see the same effect of water going on a grease fire. So this is about a two minute video. <clears throat> oh! Oh wow! that was in its initial movement right there. And so these firefighters are adding water just from a garden hose, and you can see how it flares up, just as Jeff was explaining, how that hot grease is now expanding, oil and water, get grease and water don't mix. We're now just causing a lot more damage. We're still putting some of it out. I mean, water will still cool some of that fire, but not before you cause a little bit extra damage. So if ever you see the person, a neighbor, someone in your, your area, we've got Thanksgiving coming up in a couple days, and they're going to break out their turkey fryer and they're going to put it in their garage, please go over and go, don't do that. Take it outside your garage and use it as your turkey thawed, right? Make sure all of that's handled. Um, we've been fortunate the last couple of years, we have had a couple in years past, and these fires, again, as you kind of saw, it's that mushrooming effect as that grease goes up, gets into the roof line, soffits faces, this is a fire that grows really quick and takes off. All right, it's not one you're gonna be able to control. So it can be very extensive and lost. are doing it that way yeah it could be someone does that by hand a lot of people will use a hook much like they did um, it's you just google turkey fryers and you can find any way that you think it might work <clears throat> so now we'll talk about electrical safety uh, so the best recommendation for any type of electrical appliance and device is always follow the manufacturer's guidelines. I mean, we all have a tendency, we open a box, we go, I've used these things before, I don't need to read it. Well, maybe this one has slightly different instructions. Maybe it tells you to keep it away from, it needs certain airflow, so don't cover it with certain things. You know, whatever the difference might be, you want to make sure you're aware of that. So read the manufacturer's guidelines for everything that you do. Always plug directly into a wall outlet, and that's for everything. If you're using a lamp, if you're using your cell phone charger, the best thing we can do is to put it in our wall outlets because those have extra safety precautions, either through fuses or ground faults at the panel. Uh, they're also designed to hold that. You know, that your, an electrician went through a plans review and 
uh, inspections to make sure that these do what they're supposed to do and they're safe and that the wiring behind the wall is safe. Uh, if you have to use extra outlets, a surge protector is going to be your best bet. Something with overcurrent protection. And so that overcurrent protection is basically going to protect your appliances downstream in case something comes up this way, you know, like uh, a surge, you could say a power surge, but then it protects back way and it can even cause a little trip at this before this overheats. If you use something like this, we can pass this around. You can see that this does not have that same safety feature. It doesn't have that overcurrent protection. So this had something plugged into it and it actually overheated and started melting the plastic here. And so that's where we start seeing fires. We're not gonna see fires coming from sparks shooting out. It's from these devices, these types of extension cords being over energized and then melting. And then this starts your carpet on fire. It starts whatever appliance it's on fire. Same thing here with uh, a space heater. We're gonna to wanna to make sure that we're plugging those directly into the wall outlet because these devices can't handle the energy that those draw. This is a failure of this card, as Dan was saying, these cards get brittle. Um, as we age, right, just like our bones and things, these can also get brittle. If we have them under doors, through doors, under a window, if they're tucked behind our sofa or chair, or something is sitting on top of them, causes the two layers inside, which is what happened here, which led to an actual fire. And this is just something we were able to keep from it. Um, but you can come up and see that later too, but this is exactly what happened there. The other thing is don't plug one multi-plug into another one or one surge protector into another one. That's a term called daisy chaining, if you've ever heard that. The way I like to, <laughs> we're, lots of people are guilty of it, it's, you know, and the way I like to describe it is this right here, when it received its UL listing, it was rated to take six, six things plugged into it. By now putting this in there, I can now plug up to eight. Well, this can't handle eight devices, this handles six. So now this is gonna be our point of failure. This will get overheated and it'll start to melt and that's where we're gonna get our fire. So. If you need more outlets or you need a longer cord, take the time to buy the worthwhile surge protector with overcurrent protection. And if you need a longer cord, just go get one that has a long cord. You can, I've seen someone buy these with 25 feet long cords. I mean, they come in all the different lengths. Candle safety. Candle safety, oh goodness. <laughs> Anybody's house like mine right now where your your significant other has got candles everywhere because they're beautiful and they smell wonderful? <laughs> it's awesome. Alright. So we've got our standard candle, right? This little votive candle, is that correct on you? Did I use that terminology correctly? Votive and votive and yeah. small little candle. It smells good really loud. Alright. Again, simple thing is we don't want to have a candle and have it accessible to any of our children, have it on an area that it's easily knocked over. Really, if we're being good adults, something like this works pretty well. It's in its own container. It's pretty sturdy overall. It's going to stay. I can hit the table a little bit. It's not going to tip over on me, right? These are actually even taking a whole other level. The battery operated, and they're scented now. You can even get them scented. Oh, my wife is in love with these. <laughs> it makes me happy because I don't have to have her lighting up the house anymore. Okay. Walmart. So there's a lot of options out there. Just now we're gonna show you a demonstration outside tonight about candles and things getting too close. You wanna have a buffer, right? I don't want anything that has a flame or an open flame close to something that is flammable or combustible. We wanna keep about a three foot buffer around that. If I put this on my shelf and it's over here by a window and I've got drapes, not a good idea, right? Drapes could move, air currents change in the home, my flame, boom, now we got a house fire. We just want to be smart about it. So candles are another thing as we get into the holiday season. A lot of people start using them, they don't use them year round, and then we kind of forget about little things like that. Make sure you're safe, right? Keep matches, lighters away from kids, keep candles away from them. If you're gonna show them how to use it, do it together with the help of an adult. When you leave the room, blow them off. Doesn't take anything, right? Just done. Your house is safe, your children are safe, right? Simple little things like that. Um, 
up here it gives you some of the some of the numbers on it on our 12 percent home sales are in december um, again dan said there's a lot of stuff online you can go to we can give all kinds of information out how many fires start in the state of minnesota and nationwide during the holiday season it's, it's through the roof it's crazy you guys um, we talked about the combustibles right left too close to an open flame <clears throat> and then have that sturdy base and in jeff's world please think about a battery operated cable instead we'll do everything a regular cable will do now so better safe than sorry okay Candles 101. Daniel? Smoking. Can't have a fire safety presentation without talking a little bit about smoking. Uh, so, careless smoking is still the number one cause of fire deaths in the state of Minnesota. Uh, yeah, it, that's, it leaves all of the categories uh, as far as what's been determined to be the cause. And it could be something, you know, just not following good safety precautions. Never smoke when you're on oxygen. If you have oxygen in the home, probably time to quit that habit because you don't want to even risk having something happen. Uh, the best thing you can do is either if you are a smoker or you have friends and family that do, try to have them smoke outside. Uh, provide them with a good spot outside that's you know maybe free from combustibles and ask that they smoke outside. Uh, use a sturdy ashtray, something like this, where we're going to have a good solid base. We don't have to worry about those ashes tipping over. Uh, obviously, when any ashtray gets full, we need to empty it once the ashes are fully cooled. Uh, we've been to enough fires where someone thought their ashes were out either from their grill or from their cigarettes and, oops, accidentally light, lit their trash can on fire. Uh, don't dispose of ashes in potting soil. That's probably one of the biggest things we see. I know I've had a family member that was guilty of it. And you, don't, you think it's just dirt, but potting soil comes with a lot of moss and a lot of other combustibles that over time, you'll put it out and you'll think, oh, that's out, I'll just go to bed. Well, it's slowly smoldering inside of that pot. And then you'll be woken up after that pot lights on fire and maybe mm. now it extends to your house. Uh, we had a fire earlier this year where that was what we believed to be the cause of it was using potting soil as their ashtray. Uh, store lighters and matches out of reach of children. Seems like common sense, you know, it's something that all of us can agree with. Uh, it's still a problem that we run into is, you know, kids are curious. Kids are curious about fire and it's just natural. And so we wanna try to eliminate that risk or reduce that risk by taking away something that can light something on fire. So storing those out of reach of kids. Heating appliance safety. So we talked about this. This would be kind of like our open flame segment of this. So keeping three feet from heat, that's the best recommendation we can give on any heating appliance, whether you're talking space heater, uh, baseboard heating, uh, your floor registers, um, a fireplace, whether it's gas or uh, wood burning fireplace, three feet from heat is gonna be your best practice. Same thing about storing combustibles near your furnace, near your water heater, you want to keep that stuff three feet away from there because we don't want that radiant heat to cause slow degradation <coughs> and deterioration and then accidentally start something on fire, you know, 10 years later. The easiest way to think about three feet from heat is just stretch your arm out. And so just like this gentleman is here, that's going to give you a good three feet. I mean, if you're Carl Anthony Towns, you're probably like five feet away, but the average person it's going to be three feet away and we don't have to worry about that. It seems it's a very easy thing we can do, and this is still the second leading cause of fire fatalities here in Minnesota, is combustibles stored too close to heating devices and open flames. So we're on to our next trivia question. So, true or false, there's only four fire departments who responded to more calls than we did last year. True. True. That is true. Got a winner. So last year, like Jeff said, we responded to roughly 90,000 calls. Um, the four departments that responded to more than us were Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, and Rochester. And a lot of why we have a lot of calls is we have a great population, you know, about 80,000 people. Uh, we also, like Jeff said, as an all hazards fire department, we're going on a lot of calls because we're going to those EMS calls and we're going to hazardous materials calls. We're going to 
car crashes, fires, smoke in the area. That's what we do. Because that's what we want to do to keep you guys safe. We want to keep the residents safe by going to calls and giving service whenever we can. And so I'll Jeff talk about uh, some general safety tips. Real basics up here. Again, some of it just seems common sense, but as we age, um, I know that if I, as I've gotten older, I also have an in-law that I take care of at 95. A lot of medicines laying around the house, right? Um, I don't have young children, but if I did, it would be something on my mind to keep those medicines away from those kids, all right? Keep them locked up, keep them up and away if possible. Um, know what they are, what they're used for at least. You may not know all the interactions. If you can get that from your doctor and pharmacist, great. That really helps, but at least know what they're used for. Um, and then kids, right? Time we have our grandchildren over, right? Little things they're playing with, little things they can pick up, put in their mouth, choking hazards, breathing issues. For us, it's a real big concern. Respiratory issues are the number one cause of fatalities for the children, and it's caused by either something with their respiratory, their lungs, or getting something caught in their throat. Mm -hmm. All right, so we want to try to avoid those at any cost. Uh, for us, in a general way, we want to make sure that we're getting, um, if you're higher out or if you do it yourself, make sure your sidewalks are as clean as you can get them now, right? Throw down salt, grass will grow back. I get it, I like a nice lawn too, but we don't need to slip and fall, especially as we get old. We break bones much easier. As we get elderly, we take that trip to the hospital. A lot of people go into the hospital with a broken bone, their legs, and then they don't come back out, all right? They develop other issues in the hospital, and there's a lot of death that comes with it, just from a fall, okay? Mm -hmm. Pneumonia sets in, things like that. It gets really difficult as we get old. So please be aware of things like that. Slip strips, walls, hazards, ice, snow, extension cords, rugs. I know there's a couple ladies in here that love their rugs, don't we? Yes. <laughs> you're still young. Yes, yes. All right, a few years when you're my age, get rid of the rugs. All right, if you have rugs, please make sure you're doing everything you can to be safe with them. Double-sided tape. Get them down on the floor with Velcro, something that holds them in place. You do not want those rugs moving. I don't want a corner to get caught coming up as I'm walking with or without my walker. All right, We're, and please don't do the shuffle. Everybody's got the relative, right? Yeah. We've seen this. Okay, my mother-in-law does it all the time. We've had to retrain her. We don't want you walking like that because you don't have good balance. Okay, you're not using your core muscles. You're trying to use little muscles to hold yourself up. You still want to pick your feet up and set them down, even using a walker, okay? It engages the core muscles, engages your hips, engages everything down your legs. It actually, even though it's a little uncomfortable, it's going to keep you safer, all right? So if you have an elderly person, please work with them on that. Um, and then turn on lights. That's a big one. We've got a night light here. Uh -oh. <laughs> For the elderly, put these in your hallways. Get one in each room. Um, if you have a light switch handy as you get up, turn the lights on. It doesn't matter that it's 3 in the morning. Life has changed. <laughs> right? Turn the light on so you can see what's out there. That's right. So you don't fall. Okay? <laughs> if you can see the obstruction, you're less likely to trip on it. Here's a big one we can call to. I gotta go quick because we're getting close on time. Uh oh. Anybody been elderly and they do this? Whoa. Right? It's called orthostatic blood pressure. What happens is, your blood pressure is taken and uh, it's reduced, okay? So your body needs time to adjust to let that blood that has oxygen in it work throughout your body so you don't get that dizzy feeling. So, as you age, or if you have elderly people with you, as they get out of bed or they get up from a chair, we want them to kind of get themselves set. Mm -hmm. Slowly go to a standing position with or without help, then they go, okay, now I've got it. Now go ahead and start walking, all right? A lot of people just boom, and they hit the floor. They're down, okay? You don't have the oxygen going where it needs to go to allow you to function yet. It takes time, okay? Allow that to happen. <clears throat> Dan? All right, <laughs> third trivia question. So another $5 quick trip gift card. Woo! Smoke alarms should be replaced every how many years? Every year. <laughs> well, every year would be great, but that might be a little too frequent. Ten years, exactly. <laughs> every ten. Every, every ten, ten years. years. <laughs> 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 it wasn't one to change the batteries. It was how good the smoke detector is good for. Yep. 
So we want you to have replace your battery twice a year when the clocks change. So we want you to do it as daylight savings. When you fall back or you spring forward, change the batteries. And you could even go out and buy something like these where they have a sealed 10-year battery in them. And then your net, you won't have to change the batteries for that whole 10 years. That's what they do. I so they make sure. Oh, they make sure it works there. We have good inspectors. So smoke alarms. You know, depending on the age of your home, you may have some that are hardwired. If you have an older home, maybe uh, pre-1960, maybe you don't have any hardwired and they're all just battery operated. I have one that talks. Yep, they have some that talk. Now. You might be like a 1970s, 1980s house and you might have hallway ones that are hardwired, bedroom ones that are battery only. Basically, don't worry so much about where it's getting its power. Let's worry about its placement. So we want one inside every bedroom and then one on every floor outside of the bedroom. So as you can see on our house here, we've got them inside our bedrooms, one out here in the hallway. This floor is covered because of our living room, and then this floor is covered because we have one there in our basement. And so it's as simple as that. The reason we put them inside our bedroom and outside of our bedroom is so that when the door is closed, we are alerted to a fire that happens on either side of that door. Uh, replace the unit, the whole thing, every 10 years. And you'll notice that on the back or on the sides, it'll tell you basically it's birthday. It'll tell you it's manufactured date. And that's the 10 year date. 10 years from then is when you want to replace the whole thing. Hmm. You know, I like to say a lot of people replace their cell phones every year, maybe every of other year, course. especially now with how expensive they get, uh, maybe every three years. Uh, but you want the best technology in your cell phone. Why wouldn't you want the best technology for something that's going to save your life? True. And so that's why we, you want these replaced every 10 years. Oh, too far. Carbon monoxide alarms. <clears throat> so these got a really big push, probably right around 2000. Uh, and it's just because we started seeing a lot of deaths from carbon monoxide. It's always been there. Uh, it's called the silent killer because it's an odorless, tasteless gas. You won't even know what's going on. You'll just start feeling the symptoms. Uh, so they come in all different sizes and shapes. They could be hardwired. They could be ones that just plug right into your outlet here. They could be ones that are battery operated only. Again, don't worry so much about what kind of power source, just so long as you're, again, you're also changing the batteries in these twice a year. So when you change your batteries in your smoke alarms, change them in your carbon monoxide alarms. We want to replace the or have these placed within 10 feet of your bedrooms. So the best place is usually a shared hallway. You know, we're usually going to have a bank of bedrooms that are have, have one hallway. If you put one of these out in the hallway, you're good to go. Uh, a lot of people will think, oh, this should be by your furnace because that's what's going to give you off the carbon monoxide. The issue with that is you're probably not going to hear this alarm go off if it's in your furnace because you're going to be sleeping in your bed, which may be upstairs or across the the house. The goal of this is to wake you up if carbon monoxide levels get dangerous in your house. Uh, if you wanted to put one inside every bedroom, that would be fine too, just so long as it's within 10 feet of the bedrooms. And then follow what the manufacturer says on where to install it. There's a lot of ideas of some people want it up high, some people want it on low. Uh, carbon monoxide technically mixes with air. It has a similar gas density as air. And so it's going to follow the flow of your forced air, uh, just your general air currents in your house. And these should also be replaced every 10 years. So every 10 years, you're getting a new smoke set of smoke alarms for your house and carbon monoxide alarms. When you hear either of those go off, we need you to get out of your house. You need to get out and call 911. So we want you to practice your escape route. So we want you to have two ways and no two ways out of every bedroom. Usually it's going to be a door. Uh, your second one could be a window. It might be two doors. Maybe you have a house laid out like that. And then we also want you to know two ways out of your house. Could be front door, back door, front door, patio door. We prefer you not to go through your garage, but if that's the only way out, I'm not going to judge you. I'm just going to be happy you're outside and safe. Uh, if you're in an apartment, Maybe you should know that the two closest exits down your hallway, because then you can say, uh-oh, there's fire that way, I need to go this way, that sort of thing. 
Uh, draw and practice your escape plan. So make a, a simple map like Jeff is right there and just practice it. Draw it out and then actually do fire drills in the home. Uh, you know, we do it at schools. So we all remember doing them as children in schools, and, but we never do them in our house. That's where we really need to practice. My old deputy fire chief, he would do that with his teenage daughters, just wake them up at two in the morning and say, all right, we have to figure out how we're getting out of the house. Uh, and then once you get out, Jeff has an acronym written there called EDITH. Uh, oh, sorry, exit drills ahead. in the home, right? So as Dan said, we teach it to the children everywhere. Exit drills in the home. You gotta know two ways out, really isn't that tough if you think about it, um, but you guys are the expert in your own home. You know it better than we do. We show up, we know that if south side of town, it's 1950s Rambler, our layout is X, Y, and Z, it should be real close to that. So we know, have a rough idea. We go to the north side of town, we have no clue what the house looks like on the inside. We know it's an open floor plan, good luck. All right, but you guys do know. So practice this. It's, it's nothing more than just putting a box somewhere and start drawing exits. If I'm in the living room and I'm over in this corner of the kitchen, how would I get out? If I'm in my bedroom, how would I get out? And then have a meeting place. Maybe it's a neighbor's tree, maybe it's your mailbox, but you gotta have a meeting place, even as adults, right? We tell the kids that all the time, adults need it too. When we show up, we're looking for the first adult. We see, hey, is everybody out? Everybody's out, our job completely changes, our job gets easier, we just go put the fire out now. You don't have to worry about life safety, okay? Because life safety is always number one. Close before you doze. Big one, it's, uh, it's the uh, mantra this year. Big thing is, um, is when I'm in the schools, it's real easy for me to talk about. When I was a child, I was scared to death of the dark. I couldn't sleep with my doors closed. So I think my mom had roughly 10 nightlights in my bedroom. Um, and then she'd take them away bit by bit by bit until finally I got to the point I was comfortable. I could sleep with the lights off and my door closed. Door closed, it's really this simple. Fires today burn hotter, faster, and much more toxic than anything in the past. It's not the fire that's gonna kill you, it's gonna be the smoke. The smoke is nothing but pure, toxic, gasoline, cancer-causing agents. Basically everything in our house is made out of some form of recycled plastic, period. That burns as a fuel. That fuel is gasoline, petroleum, okay? Burns black, burns hot, and you cannot breathe. Not like watching Chicago fire, okay? Our fires today, for a standard room and contents fire, fires are, and that we're talking about a bedroom, let's just say a bedroom. That fire in that bedroom is about 2,000 degrees, give or take a couple hundred degrees. Back in the day, be about 800 degrees. Fires are completely different. Why are they different? Here's a 1,000 degree fire, completely destroyed. Anyone and anything there is dead. Right next door is a bedroom that slept with the door closed. Anybody in there is a viable life. They could have gotten out and survived. So if you do not sleep with your door closed, please start doing it. One of the best things you can do to protect yourself. All right. Uh, so we're on our last topic here, fire extinguishers. So thank you for, for sitting with us. We've gone through a lot of stuff very quickly. I understand that. Um, we're just trying to make it so that we can get to our interactive portion. And like I said, we're recording this so that later on you guys can go to our website, you can go to Facebook and then you can see which segments you want to learn more about, or you can always contact us. We're happy to talk about it, and we're happy to come to your home if you have specific questions. <laughs> so fire extinguishers, they come in different shapes and different sizes. They basically put out different types of fires. Uh, you have eight types of fires, which are ordinary combustibles. That's gonna be wood, paper, the things we typically think of when we think of fire. Class B fires are your flammable liquids, gasolines, things like that. Class C, energized electrical equipment. So if we had, a, much like the fire that we had here from the space heater, that was started from energized electrical equipment. Class D is our combustible metals. That's all the fun stuff they put inside fireworks to make fireworks look really great. That same stuff is really nasty when water gets on it. And then class K is your kitchen fires. So that's like your deep fat fryers, things like that. Basically, they have different chemicals and different products inside of each to put out that specific fire. Like I said, we're not going to put water on a combustible metal, otherwise we're creating our own fireworks. We already showed you why you don't want to put water on a grease fire, so there isn't water in this Class K fire. That's going to create more of a soapy, foamy layer to smother the fire. Uh, your typical 
fire extinguisher you have in your house is probably an A, B, C. And that's gonna put out any types of those fires, an A, B, or C type fire. And that's the most common we see. That's what we recommend you have in your house. The other ones are more specialty for businesses. And then it basically, the bigger the extinguisher, the bigger the type of fire it can put out. So our last trivia question at this portion is, does anyone know the acronym that we use and we follow to operate a fire extinguisher? Pass, perfect. Well, you can pass it off. All right. Exactly, so we follow pass. It's as simple as that. P, pull the pin. A, we're gonna aim the nozzle. S, we're gonna squeeze the handle. And the second S is sweep at the base. It's as simple as that. If you can remember pass, you'll be able to remember how to put out, or how to use a fire extinguisher to put out a fire. And we're gonna have our fire explorers show you the hands-on demonstration on how to do that later. And then you guys are all gonna get an opportunity to use a fire extinguisher if you've never done that before. Well, that's all we have for our uh, PowerPoint. Um, so we're gonna take, we'll take five minutes. You guys can hit the restroom, relax a little bit, and then we're gonna go out to our bay. Uh, the only thing I'll ask is if you haven't signed in our sign. So what we're gonna try to do here, folks, is we talked about open flame safety on the inside. So this is just a simulation of a candle with draperies. Because we're doing a live, we're never sure what's gonna happen. All right, we're hoping it's gonna be a good demo. We're gonna find out. All right. So this is standard simple candle on a mantle somewhere with curtains or combustible materials around it. All right. Things to keep an eye on. Watch how fast this burns. Hopefully it'll burn good like we're hoping, like we think it will. Think about a couch being here, a lamp, other things that have a lot of that petroleum-based product, right? All the foam in our cushions, in our chairs. This is gonna take off on you in another three minutes you won't be able to see in this living room. You'll be able to be out of your house or you're gonna be on your way to the morgue. That's the nicest way I could say it, okay? So this is very quick. This is not abnormal. Again, there would be other things in associated with this. A couch, chairs, waste baskets, newspapers, whatever else you can think laying around your house. Again, go to YouTube. Hopefully we'll put some of that stuff up too and you'll see how fast these fires go. But right now, today, for the standard house, you have less than about 3 minutes and 30 seconds to exit your home. That's what you got. So you better know what you're doing. Don't try to fight it. This is a very simple controlled fire. And here's pull aim, squeeze and sweep by Dad. State. We can rent them and put these demonstrations on. Gives you a very, very good idea what happens at a grease fire. We've got a pot of grease on the stove that's heating up. Chief's going to come out. He's got one cup of water. All the ladies, for sure, you know what one cup represents, right? Not a lot of water. We're going to take that one cup of water as this pot overheats. He's going to dump that into it. And you're going to see, hopefully, real big flame coming out the front of this thing, what we call a rollover, okay? 1,700 times the expansion once we have that drop of water. Very hot, very violent, very fast. You can already see all the smoke that's pushing out of this trailer. I mean, right now it's just kind of risky, light smoke, you know, nothing too bad. But that thing will go up in the air and move. That will be building up in your house right now. You could be standing there uh, in a the room, maybe you left to go do whatever. That, wash your hands, go to the bathroom. Let's go, let's go. 
entire area. If that's your kitchen, not only is it your stove, what have you got around it? Your cabinets? Your cabinets then probably have paper goods in it, other oils. Those start on fire. It now gets into the void spaces between your walls, starts to run those void spaces, takes off up into the attic, all right? This is how quick and fast and devastating grease fires can turn into a real, real bad thing, okay? Please, no water on a grease fire. Deal? Cool? Kind of cool. All right, deal. We've got a few of our explorers. They're going to, uh, they're putting on their jackets right now. And basically, we're going to just get this lit. We've got three fire extinguishers. We want all of you to try to get a hands-on opportunity with a fire extinguisher. If you've never used one before, this is a great opportunity to do it. Low stress, low worries. I mean, it's a, it's a great time to get your hands on. So that way, in the, a real emergency, you don't have to worry about, oh, I forgot how to use this. I don't remember. The pin's already pulled, right? No, we left the pins in there because we want you to simulate everything. So remember, pass. I'm going Pull the pin, aim, squeeze, and sweep. So I have, uh, Dwayne, are you doing it? Am I? Yes, you are. Step on up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, am I? <laughs> oh my, it's burning. Oh, it's it's burning. burning. Oh, that feels kind of good though. Yeah, there's a little heat to it. So like Dan mentioned, you know, burning. Pass, you're going to pull the pen. You're going to aim it at the base of the fire. Please. Awesome. There you go. A little bit of a blanket of that foam on top of what's burning. If you were to shoot over the fire, you're basically just wasting your time. It's just going to go over the top and you're not going to do anything about it. People get excited. They decided they're going to cause more damage, but no. Nope. You shouldn't cause more damage. You're not. You may cause a little current behind it, but not enough to where you're going to cause an uproar. All right. All right. Who wants to step up and give it a shot? <laughs> Anyone? Anyone. You don't have to get too close. You know, probably eight to ten feet. You know, this might even be this is a safe distance. You'll see it has some good aim to it. Distance. Yeah, I mean, we can for a while. Yeah, okay. Some of them, some of the CO2 ones. Okay. 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 Nothing to it. 
Anybody else like to try? left to give away and uh, we'll be doing that just by raffle based on the drawing that we do out of here so well first question so whatever questions you guys have yes yes ma'am okay it's it's like dove soap or, or uh, uh, dawn right it's just a mixture what it does it helps the water to penetrate deeper into uh, the wood right and to cool that and let the water molecules do their job even more efficiently than just plain water. So that's really what it does. Okay. But we use foam on all our fires. Makes the water wetter. Great Where question. does the foam come from? We add it into our tanks. And we can also add it, we have a separate foam tank, so we can increase and decrease the amount of foam based on the type of fire that we're fighting. Um, so like if we were doing a, a grease or a gasoline fire, uh, some of our trucks we can put a lot of foam in there, and then we use kind of like the big nozzle and it actually forces more air and it can create a big foam blanket. And that's what's gonna smother the fire because we know that the water won't, it's just gonna mix and spread. Um, so yeah, that's we have two tanks, our water tank and our foam tank on our trucks. Do you do, do you tap into a hydrant ever? Or yep, so every single time we go, we're, I shouldn't say every, if it's a very small fire, we may not need to, but our tanks carry anywhere from 400 up to 400 gallons up to a thousand gallons of water our hoses we can shoot i don't know on, the, on the low end and the low end it shoots 150 gallons an hour Minute. up to 2,000 gallons an hour with our monitor on our, our tower ladder truck so it just depends the bigger the fire the more water you need so it's just a simple uh, axiom if you will yeah. bigger fire bigger hoses bigger water but your your tanks are the reservoir and the and like even when you're putting out a fire the the, the hydrant is to replenish the tank. Well, or we can bypass the tank. Buy. It goes through our pump. Yep. So each each of our trucks are going to have a pump to help speed up that water so we get more flow. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so that you just that's drinking from a garden or water hoses. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. How often do you flush your hydrants? <clears throat> we leave that up to our uh, one M. Yep, the city does that for us. Our city water department handles all the maintenance on the hydrants. So they usually flush once a year is what it's required to do. Um, and they do a real good job of that in, in making sure they're, they're working in good order. So. And we flush before every use, just yep. to make sure we are getting water out of it. Nothing worse well, than just putting your hose up and you go, oh, yep. this Somebody one doesn't put work. Can in there or, you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, you, you were talking before, you have apartment buildings, you have townhomes, you have single, family dwelling do most people know where their fire hydrants are that's a great question I'm, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say honestly uh, most people probably don't they don't have to right that's our job to know um, one thing that we do do that uh, Donya runs here is our adopt a hydrant program yeah. for the winter time yeah. so you dress up your hydrant and you can win a contest <laughs> um, so that is something that we do offer and, and what does that do right well it does a couple things one it ties into your question of that homeowner, that block, may now know where that hydrant's located. What's it gonna do for them? Not, nothing really. Um, you know, you're not gonna go hook up to the hydrant or anything like that. But in the winter time, you can help keep it clean. And three feet around that hydrant makes a big difference for us. We only have two people on our truck. We show up, we gotta worry about you or someone else being caught in the house, that's first. Number two, we gotta worry about putting out the fire. But we gotta start now by taking five or six minutes to dig out the hydrant before we can do any of that. And so now that life safety and the fire safety becomes secondary to actually get the water supply hooked up because we've got snow built up around the hydrant. So 
that that's very helpful if, if you help. And there's still hydrants available, so if you yeah. currently don't adopt one, do it. Does it have to be in your yard? Because no, nope. uh, mine's somewhere on your block. Okay, because mine's like two houses yeah. away, but it, it's accessible on the cul-de-sac, and I, yeah. and I and it's no and it's I'm, yeah, I'm sure it's open. Sure, yeah, and you know it's one of the things too. Right? You can get as crazy as you want. I mean, one of the ideas when we started this, Don, you had a great idea. You know, get your block together, go out there and have you know a hot chocolate party with your neighbors. Get to know your neighbors, right? And then everybody participate in keeping it clean. Have fun with it. Make it a neighborhood event. So do I give you guys a call, or do we just do it? You can just do it. Um, there's an app online that you can make sure that, that hydrant is still available because the object is is that we have most of the hydrants adopted so that not every person is taking care of the same hydrant. Um, but so you can go online and see if the hydrant's available. You put in the address of where it is or the block radius and it'll say if it's green, it's available. If it's red, it's taken. Oh, it's an interactive. Um, yep. Oh, all right. Well, I actually had we'll one adopted this morning. There you go. So, Tis the season. Yep, contest is going to be coming up. So. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. I, I wrote down my question, so I hope uh -oh. you don't mind. You know. Should I pull up a chair? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the first question I have is with the turkey fire. Mm -hmm. What do what are people doing wrong? Are they letting the fire get too hot? Or are they doing too much grease? Or what are they doing wrong when it comes to these turkey fires? So I'm hearing a lot of turkey fires. So one, one you could have too much too much grease in there to start with. One, it should be outside. Never in your garage, never in your house, not on a deck. Outside in your driveway, away from any structures. That's number one. Number two, you don't want to overfill your container with oil. Number three, you want to make sure your bird is actually thawed out. So if we, if you go buy a turkey, mm -hmm. right, they have, you can go online, you can talk to your grocer and anybody will tell you that a, uh, help me out somebody, but a 20 to 25 pound or 20 to 24 pound bird, you need like six days in your refrigerator for it to be completely thawed before you would put it into oil and grease like that, right? And so, dry. I'm sorry? And, and, pad, and, dry. and pad dry. Completely dry. So that's the big thing is you probably have too much grease to some degree and you still have a frozen bird because again, we're getting into that water. Um, I'm sorry, another question that I had was how dangerous is it to, because back when I was coming up, because stitcher core went wrong, my mom would take black tape and connect it to uh, another stitcher cord to get the lamp to work. How dangerous is that? Extreme. Okay. I mean, because the lamps work, but you want it. Extremely. So, yep. So, like Dan showed me like this. So, this is actually pretty wide right here. This very well could have been something that someone put electrical tape all around it, mm -hmm. but it still had a failure at a point. Does your mom have carpeting? <clears throat> she has carpeting. So, let me ask you this because you're an intelligent young lady. <laughs> if I plug my lamp into this extension cord like mom's doing, <laughs> That sits behind the couch, Ooh. and it's on carpeting. On fire. It's going to be a slow start to it, and then once that carpeting or couch hits because of the petroleum-based products, boom, and it's lighting up in a hurry. Okay, so extension cords are not your friend. They may make the light work, but there's a better way to do it, and that's using that surge protector, even if you got to get a 25 or 30 footer. But we don't want to see you with that because it's you're, you're playing Russian roulette. That's really what you're doing. Well, I have one more. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, sir. Go ahead. Keep so, going. I'm always curious about something. In 1987, I had a friend, and nine of her family members, they all died in a house fire. All of them. Um, they all perished, including the kids. So, but they said the cause of fire was one person smoking. I guess what I never understood was how could a fire, I mean, I know a fire can consume to that point where um, people would lose their lives, but I'm thinking. Shouldn't it have been a thing where there was some smoke that could have, the smoke would have... Did there, should they have working detectors is the next question. <laughs> so, no, um, and that's what they determined. Yeah. Okay. White Bear Lake had a fatal fire maybe two, three decades ago, and it was someone smoking, they were falling asleep, the cigarette fell between the seat cushions of their couch, they woke up and thought, oh, I must have been done. They went to bed. So it was that slow smoldering, it was just, it's not instantaneous, boom, there's a fire. It smoldered and smoldered, but that person's now in bed and asleep. And so that very well could have been the case where they're not knowing what's going on, they can't see the smoke, maybe they didn't have smoke detectors. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
and then and you so add on CO on top of that, right? Yeah. So this poisonous gas that we're talking about, very hot, all these toxins in it, and if you get enough CO, you're already asleep. You don't have smoke detectors at work, right? You don't have CO alarms that work, or you are even in the house. The fire happens, you're never gonna know about it unless you're awake. You get enough CO buildup. That's why they call it silent killer. You never wake up. You didn't die by the flames killing you. You died by CO or the smoke. Well, my last question, Jeff, is you were saying how people fall and they end up going to the hospital over a fall and then it turns in to something more detrimental. That caught my attention because I have osteoarthritis in my knees and I do fall. So what is it that when you go into the hospital with a fall that leads to more so, management? Great question. So I will use my mother-in-law. Um, she's a 95-year-old woman. She's just tiny. I mean, just nothing to her. Um, but I, I like to think that our, our elderly population is much tougher than I am, to be quite honest. Uh, she had a fall two years ago, broke her humerus, which is the big bone in your arm by your bicep. Um, was gonna get her up, I got her into a seated position, felt her arm, and we call it crepitus. Basically, it's like all you hear is paper crunching, that's what her bones were doing. I mean, it's just, right? And nothing out of this woman, not a peep. No pain, no nothing, right? Um, that's okay in the upper body, right? Because they can still walk and function, they can get up and, and move. As if something happens in the core of the body, so your hips on down, takes away that mobility for an aged person, what happens is the lungs and heart don't function as well as they did when we were young. Okay, and that's just the fact of getting older. So now you put them into a hospital bed or their own bed at home. If they can't get the little machine to work on their spirometry to, to keep the lungs functioning correctly, most of the time they develop pneumonia, which is what takes a lot of the people, or they can develop other things, staph infections or just bacterial infections, things like that. But no, the number one thing is pneumonia. And then the lungs fill up with fluid, they can't breathe, and they suffocate and they die. Um, and it's all based, so they died from pneumonia. What really started it was their fall, breaking their hip or their leg at home, and they had to go to a care facility or stay in the hospital after surgery, what have you. And they can't get up and around. They give you the little machine to work on. They may or may not use it, right? Do they have family members or caregivers that are helping them and forcing them to use that and understanding the importance of it? That's what gets you. Thank you. Probably 80, 75, 80% residential. Okay. Did you guys buy into that? I think so that's yeah. a fairly accurate number. Probably 85, 15. I was going to yep. say maybe higher, but yeah. Yep. Um, I have a fire extinguisher in my house that is probably from like 1990. Okay. How do you tell if a fire extinguisher is still good? Great question. Just gonna grab it. Um, so on the fire extinguisher, can you, do you have that? We'll see if we can pull up the slide, but on the fire extinguisher you have a little gauge, okay? First and foremost, you can look in that gauge and it should be in the green. Okay. No, nothing. Um, if it's in the green, that's telling you it's pressurized, so it's got enough pressure to, to propel the agent out to extinguish the fire. Mm -hmm. Now we get into the second thing. How's the propeller? Right. Right? So if you have a fire extinguisher at home, there are some maintenance things you need to do. One, every month you should be checking it to make sure that it's still in the green for your gauge. Mm -hmm. And then number two, take it off the wall, uh, your fire extinguisher that is, mm -hmm. and turn it upside down and shake it. Okay, that's a powder in there. If you don't shake that and move that powder around every month, guess what happens to it? It compacts and turns yeah. into a hockey puck, right? But guess what, Jeff? Today I was cooking and I need to use my fire extinguisher. Hey, great, I got it. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> right? Um, it's nothing's coming out. So there's still things. It, it's great to have a fire extinguisher, but one, you have to know how to use it. Two, you have to maintain it a little bit. So you just take it off the wall each month, turn it's it upside like down it. a few times, shake it, go ahead and put it back on, check to make sure your dial's in the green, you're good to go. The, another question we get asked a lot to follow up with that is, what do I do with my extinguishers out of the green? Should I go get a service? Should I go to this? No, go buy a new one. You're paying on average about $75 to have your extinguisher recharged and refilled and dealt with. You can go buy one for 25 or 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. Just go buy one. Would you take the old one? You can just bring it here. We'll get rid of it for you. Where do you buy one? Any hardware store, any large chain, small yeah. chain, usually they'll have it. Yep. Walmart? Mm -hmm. yep. Anywhere that you want to shop. We, can, we no. can't recommend anyone. <laughs> How many percentage of your calls are due to carbon monoxide? Oof. 
Those are good questions. Um, carbon monoxide based actual calls. We get a lot of calls for CO alarms, malfunctioning, um, or unknown readings, things like that. Um, actual carbon monoxide events, um, I, you know, probably less than 30 a year that are actually true events. The problem is if you do have an event, it's either, it's one side of the spectrum or the other, right? You have a very easily uh, mitigated situation or um, one that happened a few years ago for me that I was on, I uh, was over on the southwest side of town. Uh, I got called for one ill. Um, we were on a car accident on 81. Two Brooklyn Park police officers got there first, heard over the radio they had one down. Uh, right inside the front door of the house. We were able to get away from the accident, got there. When we, were, my partner and myself arrived, we had the person down and they were down. We had the other homeowner uh, also severely affected and we had the two officers that were blue in the lips, blue along their nostrils, um, feeling massive effects. We have monitors that we use at the door. I was getting extremely high readings, got everybody out. They all got taken care of, had to go to the hospital. Um, the two people that lived there actually went to the uh, hyperbaric chamber at Hennepin County. Um, and thank God survived. What had happened is these people brought in this massive generator on wheels. They had to disassemble it, get it down into their basement, put it back on wheels, ran off of gasoline. They put it in their basement. Um, they didn't know any better. And that's how they were powering their house. And they basically, well, they came as close to kill themselves. Um, and then our officers were there for less than two minutes and they, that's how fast it affected them. So you can go from nothing, or, uh, you know, just a malfunctioning alarm to, yep, we've got a little bit of CO that needs to be dealt with, to life and death in a minute. So generator is a very dangerous. Extremely dangerous inside. I was talking to her, we had a friend that he was running the band he was running oh. his house to the generator. And his son came home from school, all he did was open the door, mm -hmm. and he just collapsed yep. and passed away. So yep. I, just, I don't know nothing about generators. Do they run off gas or something? If they run off gas, right, and they're putting off CO, that's the big thing. If they're running off gas. Is that gas, a form of carbon monoxide? That is carbon monoxide. Oh, wow. That's what's going to kill you. And you'll yeah, never know. You like get a headache, you might feel sick, problem. you might lay down because you're tired or not feeling good, and you never wake up. Wow. Any fuel, uh, fueled equipment is going to create combustion and create carbon monoxide. So if you just had your lawnmower and just had it running inside your house, you're going to create carbon monoxide in there. Like car snow running snow in your garage? Snow. Car running in your garage, yeah. What about the snowblower? Snowblower, same snow thing. Okay. So and the you candle and the stove, heaters. And you got the stove yep. open and same gas. Thing. Yep. Because they do a lot of that at the hind. Yep. They do, and it's a way of a way of warmth, and we understand that. And again, it's an educational piece, right? Um, can you police it and 100% and stop it? No, but if people under, understand and can grasp the Dangerous. the scary part about that, right, is mm -hmm. that yes, it's keeping you warm and, and what have you, but they can't tell how much CO is giving off. I call the office a lot because I have severe asthma, sure. and I can smell it right away. Yep. So I call the office a lot, probably more than you guys go over there, because you get a lot of calls to the hunt. Trust me. <laughs> and come Thanksgiving, I know it's going to increase. Because yep. they don't, they don't know how to cook. <laughs> their stoves are nasty. I thought you just missed me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so their stoves. I mean, when they turn on those stoves and they have the door open. As soon as you open the, the door coming into the building, yes. you just instantly just... And that's part of it, and right from our side of things, uh, we would never tell you not to do that. You've got to look out for yourself and the residents. I got sense. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous situation, for sure. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So does it go through the air ducts? Like if I have a carbon monoxide thing in my bedroom, but not in the girls' bedroom? Does it go through the air ducts? I mean, how does it, you know, like if, I don't know. Yeah, like a cracked heat exchanger or something, something is usually is a common culprit. Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna just get pushed throughout your house through the forced air. So you'll, it'll come out the ducts. Where it builds up first, it all depends on, you know, maybe your room heats up quicker than the others. So maybe yours has a better airflow. So maybe it would build up there first, then go over to the others. Um, 
the best recommendation is just keeping this 10 feet from every bedroom, your carbon monoxide alarm. These usually go off at like 35 parts per million. You're not gonna feel symptoms at 35 parts per million. You're usually gonna feel symptoms at about 120, so about four times that. And that's when you're gonna feel a headache, you're gonna feel a little nauseous. You're just gonna think, man, what's going on? Did I eat something? You know, it's almost flu-like symptoms. Um, you're not gonna have blue lips or anything. You're just gonna feel off. So that's why even the one that he went to that was a true carbon monoxide event, it came out as a sick person, not a carbon monoxide event. Because they thought they were just genuinely sick. They didn't realize it was carbon monoxide. So, so these are very effective at alerting us at a low level that, uh-oh, something's there, we need to get out. So how long, I'm sorry, if carbon monoxide is in the house, um, how long do they recommend for it to air out before you return to your room? Well, we want to identify the source, so we'll come out, you want us to come out, we'll help you try to pinpoint, yeah, it looks like it's your furnace, then you're going to want to call, you know, XL Energy, your gas company, and they're going to come and they're going to be more thorough than we are, and they're going to try to say, yeah, this is the issue. They may even just turn it off, depending on the time of year, and say you need to get this serviced immediately. Um, it can clear out pretty quickly, depending on... I mean, now you're probably not going to want to open all your windows, <laughs> no. but summertime. When it comes, they will open yep. the windows and bring the big uh, fans. Just, just in call here. us. We'll, we'll, yeah. yeah. We'll Bottom get line is, we're going to call. We'll come in there. We're going to go through with our meters. We're going to ventilate as we need to, and and it'll be mitigated before we before yeah. we leave, or if it's a situation that's going to be red tape, as Dan said, it's out of service, and then we'll deal with finding a place to go for. Go with that night. Real quick before we go because we are about out of time. These are things, I just want to let you know, uh, this is one brand, they do make other brands. This is called Firestop. And what it is, it, it's a little uh, fire extinguisher in a can. Oh. So if we can imagine our stove, this is a really poor example, but I've got four burners. One, two, one, two. These are magnetized. They hang in between the two burners, one on each side of your stove. They have a little wick on the bottom that is temperature sensitive. If you have a grease fire or any type of fire and it gets hot enough and gets this wick to go, these will open little clamshell doors and it'll start going oscillating back and forth. It'll put the fire out on half of your stove. Mm -hmm. If the fire gets big enough, it'll hit this one and it'll put the fire out on all your stove. These you can pick up at any large hardware store. This is a brand called Firestop. They also is a generic brand. They both work great. One's not better than the other. Um, but they're a great, great thing to have. Um, if you do a lot of cooking with grease or you have children around. They stick to the like the ventilator fan or something? Yep, they'll just stick to anything metal. I'll just pass oh. this around. While we're doing that, I'll pass this around and then we're going to pick some winners here. They make a separate product if you have a microwave above your stove too. You do have, it does have to be a certain number of inches away from your stove in order for it to properly work. All right, Ms. Tanya, here we go. Right. Yeah, you ready? Just pull out a ruler and measure. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cute. Yeah. <laughs> that's cute. That's cute. That's good. Yeah, that's just good to be Adele. for health. Adele. Oh, are you serious? Get out of here, you won. <laughs> what do you mean, am I serious? Yes. Is your name Adele? Yes, Adele. 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 Come on forward, you've won. Right. You've earned a $25 gift certificate, too. Okay. Quick trip gift card for five bucks. Now we've got two IV Market Grills gift cards for twenty-five dollars each. We'll get one. Robin. 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 Really? Robin. Angle King. All right. There we go. All right. Are you not looking for a date? Are you? <laughs> Dan. Last name Dunn. No. Dunn. Dunn. Dunn is Dunn. D U N. D U N N. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Who's number eleven? I guess that would be me then. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's you. Nice. Right. Congratulations. Right. You. One more. Oh, One more. Target. One more. Target. Twenty-five Target. bucks to Target. Here we go. Dunn. Yeah. Negative, you're not eligible. Oh, darn it. Like this. Uh, Dr. Knox. Huh? There you go, girl. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh, and I didn't present this one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you all very much.